Good evening, everyone. God bless you. Good evening, good evening. It's a blessing to be here with each and every one of you today to study the Word. Just so grateful for this opportunity to dive in. I want you to take a moment and just share this out to folks so them know that we're here um, and that we're going to get into it, get into the word tonight. And I believe it's going to be, um, it's going to be good. It's, um, it's going to be interesting. <clears throat> That's what I'll say. And you'll see and, and, and uh, you will understand what I mean once we get there in the word tonight and so i just take a moment and just uh send out a quick message uh, and let the folks know we are we are here and <clears throat> we're about to study the word so tonight we want to continue this this topic on our, our journey to servanthood we uh, have been covering uh, the book of first timothy and we want to we want to continue tonight <clears throat> um, moving in that direction. Um, <clears throat> so, if we want to move in that direction, I think uh, this particular chapter is going to present some very practical truths that I think will be a blessing and it's going to be helpful. I think one of the most important things about the word is to understand it from a practical sense. A lot of people want to be hyper spiritual, and that has its place. The you know the spiritual element naturally of our Christian experience. It is a, it is a primarily spiritual um, experience, a spiritual lifestyle. <clears throat> but within the, the context of our spiritual experience, there are practical truths and practical realities that we have to consider, that we have to embrace, uh, that we have to learn. And so I think this chapter in, uh, I think that this chapter in the book of, of, of Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, is going to be, I think, informative to that end. And so uh, I just want to dive into that today. I'm just sitting on the alert just to a few more people and we're going to get in, all right? Um, so while I'm doing that, let's turn to second, uh, turn to first Timothy chapter two, and then we will dive in together. And as you do that, let us pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to hear from you. Through your, written, through your written word. And I uh, pray tonight that as we delve into these topics, I pray that you would help us to gain understanding, gain application for our lives, enable, to, uh, enable your word to do what it has always done, to speak to us, to challenge us, to encourage us, to correct us, to edify us, and therefore allow your word to grant us the knowledge that we need and help us to really pick up on the practical realities, the everyday realities that will uh, minister to us and help us to be better and to be uh, more and more who you've called us and designed us to be. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Such a blessing to see everybody here. I see Evangelist Thomas. I always got to give Mama a shout out. You know, if you're not a part of her ministry, you can uh, visit our page. You'll see her ministry there, or go directly to Violet Thomas and on Facebook, and and you will you will receive a word from the Lord that I can promise you without any <clears throat> question. And everybody else who is here, I see uh, Uplifted Heart, my sister, Sister Georgia Thomas, and there's others here. Uh, for some reason, not showing me everybody's name, but thank God for everybody who is here. And so we're, we want to dive in. Uh, sec, uh, First Timothy chapter 2, we're talking about our journey to servanthood, and we want to focus, really, this is going to be two-pronged. 
uh, we first want to talk about uh, the effectiveness of prayer and the power of prayer. And we really want to begin as we look at verse one, the Apostle Paul here again, he's writing to uh, uh, um, he's writing to his mentee, Timothy, and he's saying, I exhort, he said, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions uh, and giving of thanks be made <clears throat> for all men of course men is not specifically gender limited in this text mankind right and so um we so the first thing that we want to focus on as we dive into this chapter is uh the 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 importance of prayer and really uh the elements of prayer that makes it effective right and this is what uh Paul writes to Timothy, he says here, I exhort you that first of all, so he's saying, ladies and gentlemen, let's put this in order, right? First of all, what's the first thing he says here? He says, first of all, I exhort you that first of all, uh, supplications are made, right? Supplications are made. Um, how would you define that term supplications? Real quick, how would you define, the, how would you define that, that term supplications? How would you define it? Supplications. How would you define that term? What does it mean when you hear the word? Uh, what does it mean in the context of prayer? I see earnest request. Okay. Earnest request. Indeed. That's 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 pretty good. That's pretty spot on. Anybody else want to add real quick? How would you define supplications? How would you define it? How would you define supplications? Fervently praying. Okay. Definitely needs to be fervent. Definitely needs to be fervent, that's for sure. Absolutely. I want to dig into that. Uh, supplications now it's referring to and, and, and you're 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 really spot on. It's talking about earnest requests, it's um, it's talking about really asking for something. It's asking God for something specifically for yourself. Um, it's speaking about asking God for something for yourself. Um, and really what therefore the fact that this is the first element of what Paul in the scripture rather determines what effective prayer is, it therefore informs us that that's, that this is not the totality of what prayer is. In other words, we ought to pray for uh, things that we request for ourselves, but that should not be the sum total of our prayer. Our prayer shouldn't be a self-oriented, self-centered, self-focused type of moment, right? Uh, I like that genuine, sincere, heart, heartfelt prayer. Oh, that, that's in there too, absolutely. We're gonna get there. Uh, uh, Evangel uh, Thomas says, Gen uh, genuine, sincere, heartfelt prayer. Yes, we're, we're, we're gonna get there. And so uh, a supplication speaks speaks to uh, the uh, speaks to the idea of asking for something uh, for ourselves. And so there's nothing wrong with that. And I wanna make that clear. There's, there's nothing wrong with going to God about our particular needs. You know, uh, it's just important to understand that that is not the full scope of what prayer is. So Paul begins by saying, look, in terms of uh, prayers that need to go up, he says, first of all, supplications. And, I, and, and, and in fact, Jesus, when he taught us to pray, he said that we should pray for daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread and deliver us from evil. That is, that is an example of, a, of, of supplication. Right, so it is praying for our personal needs. It's praying for our personal needs, but the Bible also balances this reality by warning us to be careful to make sure that that is not the only thing that we are praying about. And look at really quick Philippians chapter four, verse six. Uh, this passage refers to 
uh, this passage refers to supplications. Philippians 4 verse 6 refers to supplications. I want you to see this. And the Bible says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer supplication. There it is. But in everything by prayer and, it is additive, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known. So, so, so the word is encouraging us to pray and to supplicate, right? To pray and, uh, and to offer supplications as, as we pray. Now, that being said, the Bible also balances this reality out by reminding us that it's not only about us, but turn to Philippians chapter 4, verse 3. Because as we pray for what we need, it is important for us to not confuse our need with greed. It's, you know we we have to be sure not to confuse our need with greed and 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 and, and uh, Philippians uh, I'm sorry did I say Philippians James 4 James 4 forgive me the media team is gonna get me James 4 verse 3 but you can but that that's still a good passage anyway in, in <laughs> James 4, verse 3. I got Philippians in my mind. James 4, verse 3 says, Ye ask, ye ask, and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your own lust. And so here is an example of a of different church, the church in Philippi. And, and or rather, the church that 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 James is referring to here, and and he's saying, look, y'all are offering supplications, but for the wrong reasons. They were so focused on what they wanted that their wants became greed, and so while we in fact are praying in reference to supplications, we must also ensure that. We are not allowing what we're praying for to become a source of inordinate desires or or greed, really. And then the second thing here that we see in First Timothy chapter two. So the Apostle Paul says, not only are supplications to be made, but then but then the Apostle Paul says prayers. And this is important because this word prayer specifically refers to, uh, uh, or it's 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 really stressing. This word prayer in in, in the Greek is really uh, stressing the the sacredness of prayer. Uh, that personal time of talking with the Lord, that personal time uh, where we communicate with the Lord, and and therefore it it serves to remind us uh, to whom we are talking that. That prayer is is a holy time of privilege and reverence, right? And so, yes, we pray with supplications, and but we have to understand the spirit in which we pray. It is and this and the 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 shall I say attitude and posture in which we pray. It should be one uh, understanding the, the 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 sacredness of that moment. Right, and so there are times where we can pray on the go. You know, the Bible says, you know, pray without ceasing. But, but prayer in its truest, most normalized form is that type of sacred time. And then the Apostle Paul says, okay, so 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 prayers ought to be, uh, or rather, supplications ought to be made. Prayers ought to be made, and then he says intercessions. Intercessions. says intercessions as well how would you define intercession quickly how would you define that word intercession what does the apostle paul mean when he says here 
and when he refers to intercession in First Timothy chapter two, verse one. What does he mean by intercessions? What does he mean by intercession? When you say, you know, I'm going to intercede for you, what what do you say? What, what does that mean? Or I've been interceding for you. Or somebody says, I've been interceding for you. What does that mean to you? It is prayer, but okay, I like that. Uh, first Lady says, like a mediator. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Like a mediator. Absolutely. That's a good example. I mean, oh, oh there's Evita McLeod, my, my mother, my, of the womb in which I came out of. She said, to seek. I like, oh, Georgia Thomas, he says, praying on your behalf. Asking, and first lady says, someone asking on your behalf. Yes, I think Georgia means praying on another person's behalf, I think is what she meant to say, and that, and, 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 and that is correct. Intercession means making a request or being an advocate for somebody else. Um, an example of that is in the Old Testament. Remember when Lot was was um, when Lot was was kidnapped, and um, I'm sorry, not not kidnapped, but when Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah, in, in the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah, and, uh, and 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 the angel of the Lord, three of them representing the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three of them uh, came down to deal with. Sodom and Gomorrah, and they said, we cannot do this thing and not speak to our friend Abraham, and they they, they went down and spoke to Abraham, and in that moment, as, as uh, in that moment, as they made Abraham aware of what was going to happen, Abraham interceded and said, hey, he started praying, and said, look, he said, look, if they're about 50, 10, uh, if they're 50, 30, 20, 15, 5, would you destroy the city? I like that. Uh, God bless you, Sister Sheila Palmer. She's just standing in prayer for someone. Yes, that is that is a wonderful application of the word. Uh, yes, Georgia Thomas, I, I, I corrected. I, I knew what she meant praying uh, on someone's behalf. Absolutely. And that's what Abraham did for Lot, his, his nephew. He, he interceded and said, okay, and wound up saving Lot and his family's life. And so it, that's, what, that's what we ought to do as well. Not only are we to pray about our personal needs, Right. Not only not not on, not only are we to offer supplication. Not only are we to to pray in terms of recognizing the sacredness of, of that time of prayer, but we also need to intercede for others, to pray on behalf of others. Meaning that this prayer that I'm offering, it doesn't benefit. This prayer that I'm offering, it doesn't be benefit me in any capacity. It's not a prayer for me. It's not a prayer about me. It is not a prayer that helps me, right? But I'm interceding for somebody else. Uh, and that has to be a part of our prayer life. We must identify people to pray for. Uh, and, and, and not only people within our immediate circle, our immediate family, etc., but others out there, maybe a coworker, right? Maybe a, a friend, maybe an acquaintance that just it just they just popped up in your mind. Intercede, stand in the gap. And something that Evangelist Thomas mentioned early in reference to what prayer is, she mentioned that 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 type of genuine compassionate prayer. And this, and really this 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 uh, this part of the prayer in reference to intercession is where that is applicable. That. While we intercede for others, we are doing so with great sympathy, with great compassion, right? With 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 great involvement, as it were, investment, right? We're praying not just willy-nilly kind of dry crackers kind of prayer, but no, we're praying as if we're praying for ourselves or praying for somebody, a family member who is going through. We are praying with that passion. We're praying with that fervency, right? And 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 and. and and something that helps to make intercession uh, 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 really effective is 
really understanding that person's struggle, trying to understand where that person is at, trying to put yourself in their shoes. You know, how would you feel if you were in that situation? How would you manage if you were in this situation? And we and we effectively try to really put ourselves or maybe maybe we can relate because we have already been there. That is that is a best type of intercession. Something, you know, a, 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 a path that you've walked through and, 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 and you see somebody else going through, come on, you need to begin to intercede and pray God the same way you brought me through and you and you begin to relive the feelings the hurt the pain uh, and and therefore it is with that in mind and heart that you begin to really intercede for that person that is what intercession is about and and so I want to encourage you that listen if you have not identified people to pray for begin to pray for others because there is there is a unique blessing there is there is a unique blessing when we begin to to to, to to lift others up. There is a unique blessing. Whatsoever whatsoever a person sows, so shall they reap. And as you intercede for others, you better believe God God will put you on the heart of others and they will intercede for you. And that's why the Bible says one shall chase a thousand, two shall put ten thousand to flight. This is this is really born out of what out of what intercession can do because as we pray for others, others will pray for us, and suddenly we have a conglomerate of Suddenly we have a network of individuals not even knowing, praying one for another as a spirit leads. Uh, and therefore that is how we see change. And so and so and so uh and so Paul is writing to Timothy here and saying, Look, uh, this is what needs to go up as we pray. We gotta we gotta pray with supplication, we gotta pray straight up and just pray. We've got to recognize the sacredness of prayer and we have to intercede. And then he didn't stop there, then he said, and as we do all of this. Part of prayer is giving thanks. Because he says, we first of all, he says, I exhort you therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Giving of thanks be made for all men. So we we pray in supplication one for another. We simply pray one for another. We intercede one for another. And, and we give thanks for one for and and we do this giving thanks. Not only for one another, but giving but giving God thanks for what we were interceding uh, for. For giving God thanks for the things that we prayed for concerning ourselves. Giving God thanks for the blessedness of having that sacred moment of prayer. We do this, we give thanks. And we and then he says here. We do this, we do this for all men. Don't miss that part. Prayer must be made in verse 4, or rather verse, 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 da, 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 verse 2. Sorry, verse 1. It must be made for all men. Everybody, not just yourself, but for all men. It is inclusive in that sense. So not on, so not only so not only do we pray for our personal needs or 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 the the needs of our family, um, or, or or our circle of friends, but we broaden out our prayers, and this and this the apostle Paul says to Timothy is for all men, everybody. Our prayers should include even the most detestable people. Our prayers should include uh, people who we may not even particularly like or even be a fan of. And in fact, this is what Jesus teaches us. Go to Luke chapter 6, just so you know that it's not me saying this. But but go to Luke chapter 6, verse 28. Go to Luke 6, 28. Listen to what Jesus says. Because some of y'all are going to probably, some of y'all trying to get mad at me, sir, for saying, who I, I got to pray for them too. And look, look, Jesus said it in Luke chapter 6 and verse 28. Jesus says, bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. Pray for them that are haters. Pray for them that are hating on you. Pray for them that try to get you fired. Pray for them that tried to mess up your marriage. Pray for them that tried to uh, mess up your children. Pray for them. I, I didn't write it. Don't get mad at me. It's right here in the Word. We ought to pray for all men. Men and women. Pray, pray for everybody. The ones who are in sin, the ones that are in sin, pray for everybody. And and the Apostle Paul then begins to broaden out the context of our prayers as we continue to read in Second Timothy. So he says, pray for all men in, in verse 1. And look at verse 2. He says here, and for, 
And now, if you're reading, if you're reading the the King James version, that's the best version. That's the righteous version. That's the that's the version, my favorite version. I'm kidding. You, whatever version you want is is great. But the KJV, when you read verse the end of verse one, there's a semicolon, which means verse two is a is a continuation of the same thought. So he's talking about prayer, and he continues in verse two and says, "As we pray, as as supplications, prayers, intercessions are made for all men." He continues and says, "For kings, talking government now, how how fitting, how fitting, right? We just had an election, right?" He says, "For kings, for all that are in authority, that they may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty." I'm laughing because of who got elected. <laughs> Because it says quiet, that ain't it. But we, but we gonna pray anyway, right? <laughs> it says so. We pray. It says here so we pray for kings, those who are in authority. Pray for leaders, those who are in authority, that they may lead a quiet and peaceable life. My God, we got to pray, y'all. <laughs> a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And so this this speaks to the entire government from the president to your senate to your to your house of representatives to your local officials right we ought to pray for all men in supplication intercession for all men and it's impactful because when you read in the old testament about how kings had to call christians to minister to them how uh, 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 joseph the king couldn't sleep he had this dream and it was bothering his soul and it was it was a believer who brought direction to an entire nation. That's why we pray. That's why we pray for even government and our leaders, no matter where they're at, no matter what they in, because God can step in and do what He does. So we pray for kings, all who are in authority, that they may live a quiet and peaceable life and all God in this and honesty. Yep, honesty. Uh, it's hard to find in politics, but but we got to pray for it nonetheless. And look at verse three. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. So we have to pray for our leaders. We don't have to endorse everything they do, but pray for them. We don't have to agree with all that said and done, but pray for them, right? That's what the word is saying here to do, to pray for all men, that our prayers ought to broaden out even to even to our nation. And I'll tell you, we need those prayers today. You know, we uh, at the time of this uh, uh Recording. We, we just had an election, and there are people waking up, crying, depressed, yelling, screaming, cussing, all kind of stuff over an election. We got to pray that God would minister to the hearts, you know, of folks out there because, you know, and, and I want to say this. If you're a believer and, and you are exasperated because of the election, come on. Everything that is happening must be. Everything that is happening politically is is weaving its way through God's plan to the end. So what? What is happening must be and will be and has to be. So it's okay. God's in control. God's in control. All these people are talking about, yeah, the country's over. Calm down. God is in control. So just as, you know, um, I work with a lot of Spanish folk, they'll say, tranquila, tranquilo, relax. God is in control. So let's let's not, do not jump on that that anxious wagon of everything's going to fall apart. And it happens on both sides. I'm, I'm not saying one or the other. But we've seen this, whether a Democrat got elected or a Republican. It's the end of the world. Oh, cut it out. Cut it out. God is in control. God raises up kings and God will put them down. Right? God, God raises them up and God will put them down. And God even called Cyrus, who was a, who was a pagan. God used him for his purposes. So we can trust God. Don't put your trust in government or in man or a politician your trust is in the fact that god is in control so therefore we pray for kings for an authority etc and then verse four he says so 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 uh rather verse three for this is good and acceptable in the sight of god our savior who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth so this is per this is the purpose of our prayer as we as we offer supplications prayer intercessions for all including those in government etc it is so that they it, it is so that men and women would be saved that's the goal that is the purpose that is the focus the aim and the goal of of us praying so as we pray for them yes we pray that God leaves them, leads them, but most importantly, we pray that God will save them. And I'm, t and, I, and you know, and 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 
when you look at even those in government, they some are involved in some some occult stuff, witchcraft. It is evidence that they are seeking for a spiritual answer. Our prayers can lead them right to the correct spiritual answer. And so that is why we pray for all men. Um, and then look at verse 5. The, the Apostle Paul writes, he says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So as he's talking about, we're praying that they become saved. It's important. Why? Because he's saying there's one mediator. There's one mediator between God and man. There's one mediator, the man Jesus Christ. That's why we need to pray for these folks. Because they need to encounter the only one who can mediate between us and the Father. It is Jesus Christ. Who, in verse 6, gave himself. Who, in verse 6, gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And so, this our prayers that we pray to lead these folks to salvation. The Apostle Paul is saying it's imperative because they need to understand that there's only one way, only one mediator, and that's Jesus Christ. And who is this Jesus Christ? It is he in verse 6 who gave himself a ransom for all. The world needs to be reminded that the price has been paid. The price has been paid. And that's why we pray. And, and verse 7, the Apostle Paul says here, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ. And he says, I lie not. The Apostle Paul is saying here, he is... He is, he is reminding the folks that I'm speaking from a place of apostleship. And he's saying, I'm ordained a preacher and an apostle to see that these things happen. And, that, and, and as he is ordained a preacher and apostle, as believers, we are ordained as believers with the same call to pray for others, to intercede for others, that they would find Christ. It is This is not limited to preachers or teachers. This is applicable to every believer. This is who we are called to be. This is what we are called to do. And the Apostle Paul says, therefore, wherefore I'm ordained a, 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 a teacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. This is verse 7. He says, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity, meaning truth. Therefore, in verse 8, he says here, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So he says, I, is, and, and this is, this is kind of nuanced in terms of what he's saying. What the Apostle Paul is saying here in verse 8, he's saying, I therefore that prim, he's, he's saying, I, I I therefore that men pray everywhere. And and, and so um, you can apply it in, in kind of a, a, a two-pronged manner. Number one, pray everywhere. And no matter where you're at, it's a good place to pray. And no matter where you're at, it's a good place to pray. But what the language is also speaking to is the posture of prayer. If you recall in, in, in the Gospels, Jesus talked about how the Pharisees loved to pray on street corners. And they did so in a type of ego-driven, prideful-driven, look-at-me-driven type of uh, attitude when they would pray. Well, they're praying on street corners so they can look spiritual. They're praying on street corners so that way they can look uh, 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 impressive and, 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 and spiritually astute, all, all, all that kind of stuff. But what the Apostle Paul here is saying when he says, you know, in, in, in verse 8, when he says, I therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, he's also talking about how we pray. He's also talking about basically saying, don't get hung up on the posture of prayer. It's not about praying specifically here or there, right? It's not, no, but you can pray anywhere as it were. He's, he's talking about our, our posture of prayer that we, rather than trying to pray a specific way at a specific place, 
He's saying, look, just lift holy hands and cry out to God. It could be in your closet. It doesn't have to be on the street corner where everybody can see. But he's like, wherever you are, pray everywhere. Pray everywhere. I like that Sister Seneca said, look at the tax collector, not like uh, uh, the, the Pharisees. Amen. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's a good example. The uh, the uh, Pharisee uh, was was in the temple praying, saying, you know, and, and he, he, he looked... Uh, condescendingly down at this tax collector and, and said, uh, he said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like, I said, I thank you that I'm not like this tax collector over here. <laughs> and, 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 and start to enumerate the things he did that in, that in his opinion established his righteousness. Right? That is not, uh, that's, and, and really this in part is what the Apostle Paul is saying to Timothy. Like, look, it's about lifting holy hands wherever you are and crying out to God. Now, in verse 11, the Apostle Paul begins to pivot to something that's rather heavy. Um, or rather, verse 9. He be, the Apostle Paul begins to pivot now. And he says this in verse 9. He says, also in like manner, also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, <clears throat> with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. And we'll just read verse 10 as well, but well actually no, let's yeah, let's read verse 10. But which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Now this passage has been a passage of great consternation throughout church history, really in terms of what this passage is saying. And there have been literal church doctrines that have been built on this passage. Um, and based on what you read in these two verses, What is this passage teaching us? What is this passage, when you just read it at that surface level, what would you say this passage is teaching us? And let me give you one because, you know, I got to take a drink for this one. It's water, by the way. What do you think this passage is teaching us when it, when it says in verse 9, in, in like manner, also women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works? This is a big one. Controversial. <laughs> Very controversial. And therefore, there are those who literally believe and teach that, you know, women should dress very, you know, like, like a nun in, in terms of no style, <laughs> no taste, just draw it on a drape and put the on type of thing, you know, just, just, right? Um, and the Apostle Paul says here, modest apparel, I think modest apparel is appropriate for all genders. This is not, you know, it, this speaks to men too. We must dress modestly. We must dress appropriately. Now, the scope of this passage is the scope of this passage doesn't just, people read this and they think of it about, okay, what I wear uh, to church, but the scope of this passage should really be more broad than that. How we carry ourselves generally, because we're because we're not only Christians in church, right? We're Christians twenty four hours a day. Um, but first, what he says, he says, I think it meant letting God be the focus, not wearing things that garner attention and garner much attention. And I and, and, and I think that that that's that's good. That that that's definitely a good application of it. That's definitely a good application <clears throat> of this scripture. Um, but he also says here, 
It gets specific. So it says, Mars Apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. It's interesting. I, I want you to pay attention to what he's saying because then we, we can kind of begin to understand what's going on here. He says, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Here's what I want us to understand tonight when we read this. Notice he says, no braided hair, no gold, no pearls, call no costly array. It is important that when we read the scriptures, this is like exegesis 101, biblical studies 101. Whenever you read the Bible, you have to ascertain who is the audience. Who is the audience? You have to identify who the audience is. Who is the Apostle Paul writing to? That's the first thing. So in order to understand what he's saying, we have to understand who he's writing to. Now, if you remember when we started this last week, we spoke about the fact that Paul sent Timothy to Ephesus. This city is a highly paganistic city. This city uh, uh, had over 300,000 people. That is, to, that is like modern day New York. That's like a modern day Chicago, a modern day Detroit. That's like a modern day Miami. Had a lot of people in there. Right? And it's a pagan city. And so what you have here is you have a burgeoning, growing church in a pagan city. And the people that are getting saved, the people that are getting saved are coming out of paganism. They're coming out of the world. Right? And they are coming to Christ. And so when you think about that context, it should help to inform us as to why the Apostle Paul is saying what he's saying. And, and if you notice, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he wrote to the church in Philippi, he wrote to the church in Ephesus, uh, he wrote to the church in Rome, right? He wrote to the Corinthians, he wrote, he wrote to the church in Thessalonica, the book of Thessalonians, right? He wrote to churches. Notice how this isn't in all those epistles. In other words, this was specific to the situation in this city, the this, this situation specific to this church. Additionally, one of the things that we see in scriptures is that the Apostle Paul will teach, and I'll give you an example of this in 1 Corinthians, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6 and 7. I want to show you this, 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 6 and 7. And specifically in verse 6 in 1 Corinthians, and while you're turning there, I see what the first lady says here. She says, let people see God in you, not being distracted by what you're wearing, showcasing, although I don't believe uh, there's anything wrong with looking nice and carrying yourself well, but be, uh, being extravagant is unnecessary. Absolutely. And we're, we're the, that's kind of where we're going to go. It's, it's, it's okay to dress nice. Right? There's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely no, you know, no, there, there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's about modesty, right? And, 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 and this is appropriate, again, not just for women, but this is for men too, modesty. All right? Uh, you know, for men, your, your, your pants shouldn't be tighter than I don't know what, right? You, you dress appropriately. Like, what are we doing? Um, so if you look at 1 Corinthians 7, 6, this is something I also want you to think about. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 6, he says, but I speak this by permission and not, not of commandment. So what the Apostle Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 7, 6, he says, he's, he's saying this specific set of instructions, he's saying this is my opinion. He's saying this is my opinion, not a command from God. There are moments where the Apostle Paul 
will receive revelation and say, this is what God wills, this is what God commands. But here, in, uh, specifically in 1 Corinthians 6, 7, he says, but I speak, I speak this by permission and not, but not of commandment. And so, and so, and so, I venture to say that as we read, you know, with that in mind, as we read in 1 Timothy, as we read in, 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 in 1 Timothy chapter 2 here, the Apostle Paul is writing specifically to the church in Ephesus because here was the challenge that they were going through. People were getting saved and they were coming out of paganism. And if you know anything about the paganism of that day, it was it was what we would call today very ratchet. It was very inappropriate, right? And so here are people coming out of that lifestyle. And therefore they're coming, they're ba they're basically coming to church the same way they went into paganism. And and he's saying, look, we just can't have that happening. And and then more specifically, there would be certain jewelry, certain jewelry and certain styles of dressing that were specific to paganism. Certain type of jewelry that was specific in that day to paganism. And and therefore the apostle Paul is saying, look, we're not bringing that over here. This Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And so what the apostle Paul is saying here when he says, look, and he says, women adorn themselves in modest apparel. He's saying, look, don't come in here like you go to the pagan temples. Don't come in here like y'all went to them pagan temples. No, you come here modestly. And then he says, with shamefacedness, meaning that it is likely that how they presented themselves, uh, in terms of how they would present themselves, it was maybe it kind of exuded a type of pridefulness. He says, no, you got to come in here recognizing what God has saved you from. Come here, rec you know, come, come here with a certain reverence, right? So, so, so he says, uh, you adorn yourself in modest apparel with shamefacedness. And he says, sobriety. What does sobriety mean? To be sober. That speaks for itself. Respect where you're coming into. Sober. Okay? And you're saying, what do you mean? Why would these people be doing this? Because discipleship is a process. Somebody gets saved, they need to be discipled. They need to go through the systematic teachings that establish this is what is expected of a believer. You don't make the rules in terms of what a Christian is. You don't, you, you don't make your own recipe here. This is what it is. This is what is expected. This is how it goes. And this is what the Apostle Paul was doing. He was laying the groundwork in reference to discipleship. And he was saying, look, when you come here into the house of God, he's saying you do so with modest apparel. Because in that day, the apparel wasn't modest when they went out to the pagan temples, when they went out to pagan locations. So he's saying, no, but we, so he's saying, when you come here, you dress modestly with shame faces. He says, not with broidered hair, because at that time, a specific, a, a specific style of braided hair, again, denoted the paganism lifestyle. So he said, no, we're not bringing that. We're not going to normalize what is pagan and normalize that in the church. So therefore, he said, with not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly arrays or, or costly arrays. So all of these things lend, lended itself to speak to that. So therefore, it's not even a matter of that, okay, in today's church, you, you can't wear gold or you can't wear pearls. No, no. What the Apostle Paul was teaching then was we need to be separate. We need to be different. And we can't look like we are worshiping idol gods and trying to come to the house of God. That's what he's teaching here, that there has to be a difference. And again, this speaks to the importance of discipleship because salvation is more than that moment of getting saved it is a process of of embracing the transformation in a practical sense god can do a work in our soul and then we have to do the work of 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 of, of we have to, we have to do the work of adjusting how we live based on what god did in our soul but but what is happening today is people are getting saved and living Christianity on their terms. 
Okay, now I'm saved, but I'm gonna do it. But I'm gonna do it my way. You can't bring your way because your way is what got you in the mess in the first place. And so when you get saved, you you when you come into Christ, you got to be willing to shed everything away. You got to be willing to let it all go and allow God to rebuild you. That's why the Bible says, "Get back on the Potter's wheel," because life has shaped you, sin has shaped you, your past has shaped you, and so God's saying, I'm, "God is saying, I want to break you down to dust and build you again." That's the process of discipleship, and therefore, when we read here in Second Timothy, we are reading that the Apostle Paul is saying, "Look, don't bring that unsaved stuff." into this place. He's saying, and, and, and therefore, it doesn't say to us today, and again, I, I want to make it clear, therefore, the word, therefore, the word isn't saying women cannot dress nice or wear jewelry today. Paul was saying to them in that day, in that city, in that situation, based on where you're at, listen, this is, this is how we got to handle it. And then look at verse 11, and we're, 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 uh, we're wrapping up. So let me be clear. You can wear gold. You can wear your pearls. You can dress nice in the house of God. Yes. But but what we won't do is have ourselves looking like the world. And that's not what we're not going to do. Right? You're not going to come into church wearing no club dress or, no, or nothing like that. You're not going to come in church wearing... wearing uh, 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 holy but things that as a man things that things that you'd wear going out to the club tear up tear up jeans all these kind of stuff no 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 we're different I'm not coming to church with my pants my church pants all the way down under my butt no that that's not who we are right we got to be modest we got to be different and that's why I'm a very strong proponent and and you know it's not about being you know it's not about being hyper spiritual or hyper holy, but it's about respecting where you are and really establishing a difference. I mean, look, in my church, you are not wearing a baseball cap leading worship. You're not going to be having a baseball cap on in church leading worship. You're not going to be in, 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 in jeans leading worship. You wouldn't wear jeans to an interview you will you will give you will give respect to a, a corporation or a business but you can't give God that respect well well you know pastor God 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 don't look on the outward man God God look at that the heart God God look at the heart now so God ain't looking at where you whether you wearing jeans or, or not uh, but yeah and that's the point the posture of the heart you can you can offer more respect to the world but then, when you come into His presence, you just you you just you just grab whatever. Now 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 if, now if 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 you just got saved and that's all you got, then hey, it is what it is. But it is but 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 it offers a certain disrespect when you can do better for the world and you do lesser for God. And then verse eleven, the word says here, "Let the women learn in silence with all subjection." I, but I suffer not a woman to teach or ups, or upsurp authority or usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. But, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now, this passage, specifically verse 11, is one that is used uh, to teach and to uphold the position that women should not teach in church. And this is and this is a touchy subject. But again, we have to apply the same principle that we did to the previous verses. Who is Paul writing to? And we have to understand the situation that is going on there. Pay attention to what he says. Let let the women learn in silence with all subjection what he's saying and what and what was happening in that day there was there was a lot of i guess you could say interruptions and not even so much disrespectful but just a lot of questions you know you just get saved and bear in mind that the church like 
we have a general format of how church goes. Opening prayer, scripture reading, praise and worship, welcome and announcements, uh, special items, uh, the sermon, and then uh, altar call, right? Church has been established as what it is. You are, we are reading in First Timothy about a church that is just starting. There is no way to do church. They're building this thing from the ground up. And therefore, the Apostle Paul is saying, look, this is how we this is how we ought to operate literally logistically. This is how we ought to operate. And therefore, he says, and, and, and so it seemed like whenever there was teaching, there would have been a lot of interjections about this, about that, about that, about this. And so notice what he says. He says, let the women learn in silence. In other words, it's not that women should not learn. And listen, if you're going to learn, you learn not not only to better yourself, but you you learn to teach others as well. So he says, let the women learn in silence with all subjects. In other words, we're going to do this orderly. That's all this is saying. Okay? And then he says in verse 12, But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to upset authority over, over a, a man. Now, verse 12 specifically the phrase that he uses here is, I do not permit. And that word permit is interpreted as Paul's personal opinion. And we kind of read that earlier in 1 Corinthians where he says, this is what I'm saying, it's not a command. And, that, and, and therefore Paul says in, in verse 12, I do not permit. Is what he's saying when he says, I suffer. He's saying, I do not permit. This wasn't necessarily taught to all the churches. This is this is this is what this is what was written to this church. But again, the phrase here that he uses, where he says, "I do not suffer," means "I do not permit." It is interpreted as Paul's opinion, not so much a command. Also, additionally, the Greek phrase used within, uh, uh, or rather, the rather the the. The Greek word used within the phrase, I do not permit, it is written in present tense, meaning it spoke to that specific condition of that location and situation. So when you look at the role of women in ministry and women in the kingdom, they're very important. And for those who say women can't lead, uh, you can go back to the book of Judges. And you will read about Deborah, who was a judge. And for those who don't know, a judge was somebody who served as a spiritual leader and a civil leader. A judge in the Old Testament would sit before the people. If you remember how Moses used to sit before the people and, and his father-in-law Jethro said, look, you, you can't be doing this. You got you to gotta get some people to help you. Moses served as a judge and that that same type of application is there when we talk about old testament judges deborah was a judge the people came to her you read about uh, uh and and all throughout the new testament the strength of the church was was women and so when we read this it's important to understand context women can teach women can preach And, and I want to say this as we close. It's important to understand when, when God created Eve, Eve was considered a helpmeet. When you study that, you will find that Eve wasn't made to be lesser. She wasn't made to be less. It's all about roles. We all have roles. You can think of how the Bible teaches about the body of Christ. Give honor to the smaller parts of the body, the Bible says. We each have our role. And when God created Adam and Eve, they were both his creation, who he loved equally and who were valued equally. 
It wasn't until the fruit was eaten that God said to the said to Eve, "Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over thee." And it, and it is at that point that there was a difference, not only of roles but but authority. But I want to establish and have you understand today that God's intent in creating Adam and Eve was that of equality but different roles. Because there are those who like to use the occurrence of what happened in the Garden of Eden to really devalue women in a way that is unbiblical and it's not right. But it's, and therefore, it is important to understand. And, and you know, it is therefore important to understand the difference in roles. And, and, and this is very applicable when it comes to marriage. Understand your role. Yes, I am the head of my home. But my wife is given the utmost respect. And husbands will tell you. <laughs> husbands will tell you. As, as much as we are the head of the home, the wife is the neck that turns the head. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard that before, right? So the role, the role of a wife, and more broadly, the role of a woman is very important. It is very important. And in fact, when you look, listen, the church simply could not be if it wasn't for women. Today, today, this day, the major, the, this, the majority of the laborers in ministry is women. And so we give honor. And so I focus on that because I want us to understand tonight what the word is saying and not to become part of this rigid, um, dare I say, old school traditional application of that text. It's not to say that women shouldn't dress or women uh, dress nicely. Women shouldn't wear gold. Women shouldn't braid their hair. That's not what the word is saying. That's not what the word, the word was speaking more so to the process of discipleship and us ensuring that we are not conforming to what the world looks like, but rather we are marking a difference. And that's it for tonight. I hope that this pad, this this text was informative. I hope that it helped us. We 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 spoke about prayer. We spoke about prayer and and, and the three broad elements of prayer, and then we we kind of addressed that uh, proverbial elephant in the room, and uh, in reference to women and teaching and their role in the church. So I I hope it was a blessing and encouraging uh, encouragement to you. If, if if you know someone needs to hear it. Go ahead and share this. Let them know that we, we, we dove into it. We covered it. And I think it's going to be a blessing to them. Let us pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you for the practical truths that we can glean from it. Help us, Heavenly Father, as we pray. Help us not only to offer our supplication in reference to what we need. Help us not only to recognize the sacred nature of that time of prayer, but help us also to intercede with others and to... And to give thanks for all men, and that God would broaden out our prayer, not just not just for our fellow church members, not just for our family, but God, that we pray for acquaintances, distant friends, that God would pray for this government, and we pray a special prayer right now for this nation, as we are uh, as we are approaching the peaceful transfer of power. We pray your hand will remain on this country, will bind us together as a nation with cords that cannot be broken. And so, Father, minister to your people. I pray for women who are in ministry. Of Across the world, empower them, strengthen them, edify them, anoint them another time, and help us as men, as pastors, as leaders, to 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 to, to encourage and and, uh, uh, and and to empower them as they do your work. And we thank you for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us, Lord Terry's and Spares. We'll be back with you next week on behalf of First Lady, Doctor Ruth, my wife, and the entire Fountainhead family. Thank you for being with us. Uh, be aware that we are having uh, our uh, fall convention, uh, November 15th through 17th. We have Minister Gunter on deck, Bishop Gunter, and also Minister Chris Watkins from New Life Worship Center, who will be ministering to us Friday and Saturday. And I will I'll wrap it up at our Sunday morning service, our Sunday afternoon service. And so we're just excited. Be prayerful about that. We're believing that God is going to do something extraordinary. We love you. God bless you. Have a great evening, everybody.